Our second reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 17, found on page 826 of your Pew Bible. Would you please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel? Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before them and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it into a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Having some historical perspective on biblical times, helps us to understand the settings of our readings. Today we heard about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But how does this entry compare to the entrance of other leaders of that time? The Greek author Plutarch gives us a description of how leaders are supposed to enter a city. He tells us about one Roman general, Aemilius Paulus, who won a decisive victory over the Macedonians. And when Aemilius returned to Rome, his triumphal procession lasted for three days. The first day was dedicated to displaying the artwork that Aemilius and his army had plundered. The second day was devoted to all the weapons of the Macedonians that he had captured. And the third day began with the rest of the plunder, worn by 250 oxen, whose horns were covered in gold. This included more than 17,000 pounds of gold coins. Then came the captured and humiliated king of Macedonia and his extended family. Finally, Aemilius himself entered Rome, mounted on a magnificent chariot. Aemilius wore a robe of purple interwoven with gold. His laurels he carried in his right hand and was accompanied by a large choir singing hymns, praising the military accomplishments of the great general. That, my friends, is how a leader is supposed to enter a city. But the king of kings, he entered riding on a lowly donkey. If he had consulted with his political advisors, they would have been aghast. What was he up to? Leaders are supposed to project strength and power and have things named after them. But that's not how Jesus rolled. 
Today's reading is a continuation of Matthew's theme from last week about those who know yet do not do. So far, Jesus has been traveling throughout Israel and Judah on foot, preaching and teaching for some time. But now as he approaches Jerusalem, for some reason he decides to change his mode of transportation and sends two disciples ahead of him to get the appropriate conveyance. In this case, a donkey and its colt that he had arranged to have waiting for him. I find it interesting that he changes mode of travel here. As we heard in our earlier reading from Zechariah, there are messianic overtones to Jesus entering Jerusalem in this fashion. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Zechariah is not clear on the identity of this humble king. Historians believe it could have been the Lord or a historic individual such as Alexander the Great or the prophecy of a future ruler in the line of David, which is precisely what Matthew is pointing to here. Where the Zechariah passage is open to interpretation Matthew is precise in describing Jesus' approach to Jerusalem from the east across the edge of the Mount of Olives to Bethpage, which marks the extreme outskirts of the city. This particular route would have reminded the Jewish readers of the trail taken by King David upon his triumphant yet tragic return to Jerusalem after the defeat of Absalom who was trying to usurp his rule in 2 Samuel 19 and 20. Matthew is drawing a direct comparison between King David and Jesus, who the crowds hail as the son of David. But where David entered as a mighty, triumphant military king, Jesus is redefining the nature of royalty and power. The messianic identity of Jesus is sung out by the crowds that line the road to Jerusalem, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Which is a quote from Psalm 118, and could be translated as, Save us, we beseech you! A prayer from the Jewish people to their Messiah, the King who comes in the name of the Lord a prayer that would have gone up from Israel to God many times during the past centuries in troubled times like these. The crowds accompanying Jesus identified him to the residents of Jerusalem as the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. And they were not wrong, but neither were they completely correct. For Matthew, Jesus is a prophet like Moses and the succession of God's prophetic line. And like the other prophets of Jerusalem, Matthew knows that the people that hail Jesus' arrival as the Messiah today will ultimately turn on him and call for his crucifixion. So while their understanding of Jesus' identity is correct, their actions will not be correct much like the goats we heard about last week in the final judgment. Knowledge unaccompanied by action is useless. It is damaging and damning and sets us on the road to perdition. So Jesus, whose kingship is marked by a cross and not a crown, enters Jerusalem to the shouts of acclamation from those who will ultimately reject him, setting up the extreme irony of the passion story that is to come. It is important to note that Jesus is entering Jerusalem just before the Passover, 
one of three major pilgrimage festivals of Judaism that would draw observant Jews from far and wide to Jerusalem. Thus it would also be one of the times of year when the Roman garrison would be on highest alert to keep peace in this troublesome province. The time of Passover was already loaded with rebellious overtones as this was the observance of Israel's deliverance from captivity and slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt. It was therefore a time when there were hopes and occasional plots to overthrow the heathen Roman occupation of the Holy Land. Therefore, the whole city would be in a state of heightened nervousness by both the residents and the pilgrims and the Roman legions due to the possibility of civil unrest and military response. The ceremonious arrival of this son of David to Jerusalem at this time would just have greatly escalated the tensions across the board. And as Jesus entered the temple and drives out all the sellers and buyers and money changers, he adds to the uneasiness and anger of the scribes and chief priests who are upset by the uproar that he is causing in the temple, especially seemingly the children who are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Jesus is transforming the temple before their eyes and they don't like it. It is changing from a place where people go to pay for sacrifices to God through the, the priests and the merchants to a place where they can receive healing directly from the actual son of God. It's a definite swing of power from the temple away from them to Jesus and they're not happy about it. Note again that the ones who are supposed to have the right religious understanding do not respond in the correct way. It's the innocents, the children, who rejoice at the Messiah's presence, while the religious leaders become angry at the presence of the one who is supposed to be the answer to their prayers. The irony deepens. The co-creator of the world came into his own temple and the religious authorities did not know him, but the children did. Instead, the leaders began plotting against him, plotting his downfall. They would sooner collaborate with the hated Romans than give up their power and wealth to the Messiah. The question to the original readers of Matthew's Gospel is the same one as it is for us today. Now that we have joined with the crowds, greeting Jesus with loud hosannas, how will we react when we come into conflict with the entrenched powers of the world that do not want to give up or even share power with their rightful king. Do we try to blend in and avoid calling attention to ourselves by going along with the expectations of society? Or do we risk standing out and receiving the derision of the crowd by following the example of Jesus and serving him and healing those that society shuns? Now it's an easy intellectual exercise, but one that becomes complicated when we are faced with the pressure of our peers to go along and get along. Perhaps the pressure is to keep those people out of our own backyards. Those that are in obvious need, but are so unlike us that they make us afraid about what might happen if we allowed them into our midst. Perhaps it's the recently released ex-con that is trying to start a new life, 
Perhaps it's the homeless who dress and act kind of funny. Or perhaps it is those who are fleeing violence and oppression in another country who have traveled a long, long way only to hear there is no room for you at the inn or even in the whole country. We're full up. Go back home. How many times was there no place for Jesus? In the inn after his birth and in Bethlehem after his birth and even in Israel after his birth as he and his family had to flee to Egypt for safety. Throughout his ministry, Jesus moved from place to place, healing and teaching. As Jesus said earlier in Matthew, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Do we stand with Jesus and humble servants to the least of these, our brothers and sisters? Or do we turn away and do nothing? We know what we should do, but do we actually do it? And where do we even start with so much need in the world? Well, we can start here at home, communicating with our elected leaders, and then interacting with the people that God sends into our lives each day. We can just be present and notice the needs of those around us. And yes, it could be hard knowing if we might be getting scammed or wondering what people might do with the help that we offer them. But that's not as important as just offering. Maybe just sitting and listening. Just treating the less fortunate as people rather than as lepers. Treating them the way that we would want to be treated if we were in their place. It's easy to wave palm branches from the side of the road. It's much harder to stand against the will of the crowd that is calling out for blood, innocent or not. Jesus was willing to stand before the anger of the crowd. Jesus was willing to speak truth to power. And Jesus was willing to lay down his life for his friends. Thanks be to God that we are not usually called upon to make such sacrificial decisions. But we can still look out for the fear, hatred, and injustice that is all too often among crowds and speak words of acceptance and inclusion to those that the world rejects out of fear and ignorance. If we can't be Christ, we can at least try to be a friend to those who need one out of gratitude for the grace and love that God has given us. We know how the story ends. Let's follow the example of Christ and move the world in the right direction. Through our local food pantries, through our local outreach agencies, and through our elected representatives. Let us look for the image of Christ in those that we meet and respond accordingly. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.